morning during chapel, so I'm very excited. So thank you for coming, and welcome to our church. Um, VBS is coming, believe it or not. I know it seems far away, but it's not. Um, we had put some flyers and bulletins, and we still need a lot of people to sign up. So I just this morning put a sign-up sheet out there. If you've already signed up, we do have your name somewhere. But um, if you haven't signed up, please sign up. We need to get going on that pretty quickly um, because we are writing our own VBS. It does take a lot more work and thought. So please go ahead and sign up there. Um, and if you haven't done it before, you're welcome to sign up. You don't have to be uh, have done this before. We'll help you. Um, and then secondly, we are going to start putting together our Sunday school rotation for next year. If you'd like to help teach or shepherd for that, um, anybody in seventh grade or higher next year can help with that. So we'd love to have you sign up for that as well. All right. Thanks. Um, a few more. Again, ground baking ceremony, April 7th. Please be here. How many more days? Oh. We also have a birthday this morning, Dominic. It is his eighth birthday. Standing around, he is actually standing up. Look at that. <laughs> Youth group 5:30 here tonight at the church. Are there any more announcements this morning? Oh, yes, we do. Hi. So. If any of you guys came out last night, we had our Relay for Life chili cook-off. Uh, it was fantastic. We had a chili win that he doesn't go to this church. I believe he goes to Northmar. So outsiders win, too. And this is his third year, too. So he's, he's the one to beat next year. Um, we had some kiddos from our church win the kids' competition, Elise, Maddie, and Emma Varley. They all won the, the kids' It's a chili cook-off, but they brought soup and they won with the soup, so yay for them. And our um, Brent Heisenreiter, I can't say your last name very well, he won um, the soup with a Greek soup. We made $920 for Relay for Life last night. Thanks. <laughs> But we're not done yet because um, we had a bake sale in addition to that and we still have stuff outside. So we don't have donuts today. So sorry about that. We don't have our donuts usual. But we do have bake sale stuff from last night. So please buy bake sale stuff, support Relay for Life. Um, there's also angel pins out there and car... I don't know what they are, Jessica Dedick's not here. Um, like vinyl that you could put on your car, there's, it says HUM, or you can put them on a mug, or you can put them on a, like a metal coffee mug. They're out there too for a dollar. Um, the angel pins are a dollar, and most of the um, bake sale stuff is a dollar. So I, I believe all of it's a dollar, actually. All right, thank you so much. Any more announcements this morning? If there are no more announcements, please stand and greet one another. Friends, I can invite you to remain standing as you return to your places this morning. If you are able, please remain standing as you return to your places. 
And as we begin our time of worship today with our opening song today, it's called Mighty to Save. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Then mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of mission. mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. each one of us. You did it with your amazing love and grace. You sent your son Jesus here to earth to conquer the grave, not just for Jesus, but for each one of us that we might be able to be in heaven with you and those we love one day. So we give you thanks, Lord, for that wondrous gift, and we give you thanks that you are here with us right now in the midst of our lives. With every day that we face, you are here, and no matter what we face in life, you are also mighty to save. So help us to believe in you, Lord, and your mighty power to save us. May we carry that hope out into this world when we leave this place this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Have a seat, guys. Some of the kids are going to come and join us, okay? Have a seat. Well, first of all, that was some great singing, kids who just sang. And if you want to join the choir, you just let Miss Kelly know. If you want to be over there in the choir, we'll be happy to use you, okay? All right, I'm going to tell people a story today about a man named Simon in the Bible. When I talk with the adults, when you guys go back to Children's Church. And that man told us, he heard a story by Jesus, okay? So I'm going to ask you guys to imagine for a second. I'm going to pick on these two Elizabeths here beside me, okay? So I'm going to give this Elizabeth a dollar, and I'm going to give this Elizabeth $20, okay? Which person do you think is happier right now? <laughs> Elizabeth Davis or Elizabeth Darren? Which one do you think is happier right now? Okay. Elizabeth Davis is happier right now? Now watch this. I'm going to take this away and take this away. Which one do you think is sadder right now? Yeah, they're both sad, you're right, but probably Elizabeth Davis is sadder, right? Because she just had $20 in her hand, and now it's gone. Well, guess what? I'm not giving it back to them. <laughs> I'm putting it back in my pocket. Neither one of them has a 20 or a 1, okay? So the point is, and Jesus tells a story like this to a man named Simon in the Bible today, and what he says to them is, you know what? We may think that we have, and, the, and, the, and Jesus tells a story. He says, imagine that two people had a debt, okay? They owed money. And one was really big and one was really small, but neither one could pay the debt, okay? But both people were forgiven. He said, which one is happier? And Simon said, well, the person who owed more money, like I just did with the two Elizabeths, okay? So that person, you know, if you have something taken away that's bigger, or if you have a debt forgiven that's greater, you're happier. But the point of the story that Jesus was saying, okay, is that every single person, okay, she, both of them should have been happy to receive something. Both of them should have been sad probably to have it taken away, okay? But imagine that you're given a gift at Christmas and your brother or your sister is given something you like more, okay? It's really easy to be jealous, okay, of somebody else, of something else someone else has gotten. But someone has given us a gift, we should appreciate that, okay? God has given us Jesus and Jesus will give the same gift to all of us, okay? It's all the same for each one of us. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to teach us how to live and love, and we all have that gift, and it's all the same, okay? You may have different things in life that you get, all kinds of presents and things that you get, all kinds of gifts that you get and receive, and you may like some of them and not like other ones, okay? Or you, there may be all kinds of things like that that happen that are sad days and happy days, but God is always with us, and God always has Jesus to see us through. No matter what happens, Jesus is the same gift for each one of us, okay? So this Elizabeth was given, you may think, a greater gift when you see something like that. You may think sometimes that happens in life, okay, that some people have been given greater gifts. But you know what? We've all been given the same gift of Jesus, and so we're all equal that way. God loves us all equally. God gave Jesus to every one of us. It doesn't matter how old someone is or young someone is or anything like that. God gave Jesus to everybody, and that's the greatest gift that's ever been given. And that gift won't ever be taken away, okay? That gift won't ever be taken away. We always have Jesus. Let's say a little prayer together, everybody. Dear God, thank you so much for sending Jesus, which is the greatest gift of all. And we pray that we'll grow up knowing how wonderful that gift is because we'll get to know you so much, Jesus, as we grow up. So help us be the boys and girls as we grow up who know you and love you and realize you're the greatest gift of all and that you were given to all people and you will never be taken away. So we give you thanks for that, Jesus. Help us to believe that and share that news with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, everybody. You go back to Children's Church. Yes, Jesus loves me. At this time, we share our joys and concerns. So if you have a joy or a concern to share, please raise your hand. Asher will be by with a microphone. Right here in the middle. Hi, 
I ask for prayers for a friend of ours, Fred Nolan, who's been diagnosed with bone cancer. Right here in the middle. I have a joy because Haley turned 16 on Monday, but then I have a concern because she got her permit. Yeah. So just, you guys have been warned. I have a quick joy about the uh, preschool program here. Um, me and my wife went to an orientation for a school that we were looking at for Jackson for kindergarten. And, all the things they would like him to be ready for, to do things, I would say 95% of the things he can already do um, that they want the children to do or learn by the time they're done with kindergarten. So a very shout out to this preschool program, the teachers, um, Ms. Janelle, how they do a great job of getting these kids prepared for kindergarten. So we are very grateful for that. So please, if you know anyone, um, let, let them know about the preschool program. It really does prepare them um, for the next, uh, for kindergarten. Are there any more joys or concerns to share? If there are no more, please join us with Firmly Grounded with Sinina Broken Vessels.
with me for a moment of silent prayer as we come to our God together in prayer today. Lord God, as always, we gather in this place to give you thanks and praise for the wondrous and loving God that you are, for your blessings that you give to us every day. But we've just sung a song, Lord, that reminds us that we are just broken vessels. We have times, Lord, when we don't have the strength that we need. We have times when we don't have the energy that we need, the spirit that we need, the love that we need, the patience that we need. We just heard little preschoolers sing a song, what the fruits of the spirit are, that those things come from you, and they energize us, and they remind us, Lord, that when we are broken vessels, your spirit fills us and allows us to have gentleness and faithfulness and self-control and love and all the fruits of the spirit that can be in our hearts and in our lives when we're filled by you. And so we come here together this morning, Lord, to this place to open up our hearts and lives to you again, to be filled by you, to feel your spirit move in this place and within us, to touch us and fill us, to draw us close to you, to remind us again that we are meant to be in your presence and meant to be filled by your spirit, that we were in fact created to be filled by your spirit to give us all that we need in life, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control, the strength that we need each day so that your love can flow out of us. So fill each one of us this morning, Lord, broken vessels that we are with your spirit again. And we pray for anyone, anywhere who needs to be filled by your spirit also or touched by your healing hand. We pray for Fred's friend this morning you mentioned who's bone cancer. We pray for all those on the prayer request list in our bulletin. And we pray for anyone whom we name before you silently this morning in our hearts. Wherever the touch of your healing hand is needed or the strength or comfort of your Holy Spirit, we pray, Lord, that you would be with each person in a mighty way and fill them as you would fill us. Be with them as we long for you to be with us so that they would know in the midst of their struggles that you are God and you are with them. And may we be filled by that spirit together this morning in this place. And when we leave it, when we go out into this world, May it flow out from us and remind all your people everywhere that you are alive because you are alive in us and they can be filled by your spirit and have what they need because they see it in us and feel it flow from us into their lives as we love them and encourage them and help them and give them hope and strength. May all these things happen, Lord, that you might be glorified and because we might be growing to be more like Jesus every day. And we pray these things in his name, the name of Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord and Savior, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We worship God at this time through the offering of our hearts and our treasures.
Father, we come to your throne with humble hearts as we are thankful for the blessing you give us daily. I pray that as we give you our offerings and tithes that this morning that we will all think about the fact that this tithe is yours. It belongs to you. May we never withhold what is yours. Please accept these offerings and tithes with gladness, Lord. Amen. Friends, our message this morning is one about God's ability to save us, and it's about our need to repent. And so the first song is God, Mighty to Save. It talks about God being able to save us. And so uh, this next is an older hymn that talks about how God calls us and asks us to surrender our hearts and be willing to repent. It's called Softly and Tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See, on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Come home, you are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are we. Come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, you are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. I would please to follow along as we join in our scripture together and read that together this morning. It comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Hear the word of the Lord. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You would judge correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. 
You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. The sense of the reading of God's word. Would you please take a moment to pray with me and for me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You remember when you were little, you used to play a game called Simon Says. Everyone's probably played that game at one time or another. One person named Simon gives orders for other people to follow. And Simon tries to trick people. Sometimes he says, Simon says, do this. Sometimes he doesn't say, Simon says, do that. And if you don't follow the proper orders, you're eliminated. You sit down. You don't get to stand anymore. You're excluded from playing the game if you don't do what Simon says. Well, there's a man in our scripture this morning named Simon. And he was a Pharisee, which means he would have closely followed all the religious rules of the day, and he would have taught others to do so as well. Simon would have done all the Simon says kind of things, the rules they were supposed to do. He would have followed everything correctly. He wouldn't have worked on the Sabbath. He would have eaten the right foods. He would have sang the right songs. He would have tithed 10% of his income to God. He would have sacrificed the right animals. He would have followed all the right rules. He would have been a good person who pretty much had it together. But the thing about the religious leaders back in that day is that they didn't understand who Jesus was. They were trying to figure him out. And so this Pharisee named Simon invited Jesus to come to his house so he could talk with him, have dinner with him, and try to figure out who he was, have some one-on-one -on -one time with this guy and see, is he really some type of teacher, some type of prophet? What is it the crowds who are following him see in this man? And these types of dinners were fairly common. It was kind of a formal banquet where a man like Simon and other guests of honor would have been there and they would have been reclining on what we would call a couch. And it was occasion to discuss theological issues because, again, Simon's trying to figure out who is this guy. And so they're having dinner and talking when suddenly their discussion is interrupted by the surprising entrance of an uninvited guest, a party crasher, if you will. And we read in Luke that this is a woman who had lived a sinful life. And although Luke doesn't come out and say it, most Bible scholars assume she was a prostitute. But that doesn't really matter. What matters is that she was someone not like Simon at all. Simon who knew all the religious rules, who was doing all the right things, who was actually a pretty good person, not a sinner like this woman was, maybe he was thinking. But imagine Simon's shock when she walked into his house. Imagine if you were having a dinner at your house and an uninvited stranger walked in and started talking to and acting this way with one of your guests. That's really what happened. Imagine how shocked Simon was, just her showing up at a house, uninvited, is outrageous. But here's the next thing she does. She touches Jesus. She touches him. Now, if you hear last week, we talked about the woman with the flow of blood and how when she touched Jesus, she made him unclean. This woman is doing that same thing. This woman is a sinner. This woman is not invited there. She hasn't gone through the proper ritual. She isn't clean, and she touches Jesus. Now, she Jesus and all the people there, you would think that they're in shock. And yet, how this man reacts, Simon's trying to figure out who Jesus is. So he doesn't really react. He says to Jesus, he thinks, he could, there's a verse where Jesus think, Simon thinks to himself, he says, if this man were really a prophet, he would know who this woman is. He would know what type of person she is. He wouldn't be letting her act this way. And then, you know what she does? This is really shocking. She lets down her hair. Yeah, I know. 
she lets down her hair because she's going to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and perfume. Well, a woman would never have let down her hair. That's just as scandalous as anything else that she's doing. She's acting like a shameless hussy in this stranger's house. She doesn't know Simon. She comes in, and this is how she acts. And Simon must be upset, must be thinking to Jesus, when are you going to get this person out of here? I'm watching you, Jesus, to see how you're going to react. What is it you're going to do? And what's Jesus' reaction? He tells Simon a story. He says, hey, Simon, there were once two men, and both owed a tremendous debt, one 500 denarii and 150 denarii. The thing is, neither one of them could pay the debt back. And to me, that's the key to understanding the story. Neither one of them could pay the debt back. And so he says, Simon, both debts are forgiven. Which man do you think is more grateful? Who do you think is happier? And Simon says, well, I suppose it would be the person whose debt was bigger whose sin, whose debt was forgiven, representing whose sin was forgiving. And Jesus says, that's right, your answer is correct. And then Jesus talks about the actions of this woman. Her debt was greater. Her sense of needing forgiveness was greater. She was desperate to be in Jesus' presence. She was desperate to be forgiven by Jesus. She went to extraordinary lengths to come into some stranger's house to be near Jesus when she heard he was going to be there. She let down her hair not caring what the ramifications of that were because she wanted to pour perfume on Jesus because she wanted to be there. She wanted to say she was sorry. She wanted to ask for forgiveness because she was desperate and she didn't care if it looked scandalous to others. She wanted to be in the presence of Jesus and say Forgive me. Forgive me. I'm desperate, Jesus, to be in your presence. And then Jesus compares that to the actions of Simon. There's supposed to be some things you followed when a dinner guest came to dinner, some procedures you're supposed to do. Jesus was supposed to be given water for his feet. He was supposed to be given a kiss on the cheek, some oil for his head. And Simon did none of those things. He wasn't treating Jesus as a respected guest because he didn't understand who Jesus was. He was just someone he invited over to dinner to try to figure that out. And so he's saying, Simon, don't you see how you have treated me as opposed to how she has treated me? And so why? Why are they acting so differently? Because Simon was pretty comfortable in his own goodness. He was a good person, not like the woman in the story who desperately needed the change. In fact, Simon was a religious leader. He didn't know who Jesus was. He's trying to figure it out, but he was someone who was basically a good person, who did all the right things. He knew the right rules. He followed them all, and Jesus is trying to say that Simon's like the person who owed 50 denarii, the woman like the person who owed 500. She was grateful for her sin to be forgiven but Simon himself was not. So what does this story have to mean for us today? What does it have to be, what does it mean for me today? Well, let me confess my sin to you all this morning. You heard me say last week that sometimes my name is Jairus. Sometimes also my name is Simon. You see, I'm a pastor. You all know that. And it's far too easy for me to think sometimes, you know, I do pretty much the things I'm supposed to do. I'm a pretty good person. In fact, I probably spend a lot more time in prayer than most people do. I probably try to be a lot closer to God than most people do, even people who consider themselves good Christians. And it's probably easy for good Christian people to think that too, you know? I'm a good person. I live my life the way God wants me to. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but you know, I'm not like those people pushing drugs out there. Those people, man, they've got a great debt to be forgiven. I'm not like those people out there beating women and children or something. Those people are horrible. They're terrible. Yeah, I'm not like that. Sure, I'm a sinner, but I don't have sin like that in my life. It's easy for me sometimes to think I'm a pretty 
good person. And really, I am. Really, you are. You're probably good people, good-hearted, kind people. And so the person we're supposed to identify with in this story is Simon. Not the woman, but Simon. Because Simon is a good person. Simon goes to church. Simon does the things he's supposed to do. Simon treats people the way he's taught to, the way he's supposed to. But still, somehow deep in his heart, Simon is not desperate to really have God get a hold of his heart and help him change and grow. Simon's not really able to see that his debt cannot be repaid any more than the woman whose debt is seemingly so much greater. His debt can't be repaid as well. He should be just as thankful that his debt has been canceled. Just as thankful as that woman that no matter what he has done in his life, it has been forgiven because he, just like us, we can't do anything to earn forgiveness. We can't be good enough people, do enough good things to be forgiven. It doesn't work like that. Forgiveness comes from God. It is God's grace. It is Jesus Christ dying upon the cross, raising up from the grave, that first song that we sang, that God is mighty to save, not us. We can't do that. God does. And so the key to the story is to recognize that we all have a debt we can't repay. All of us have sinned. But you see, I sometimes play a game called Matt Says. It's kind of like Simon Says. But if I'm honest with myself, sometimes I play this game called Simon Says, and it goes something like this. I think to myself, and all those people, I think about the worst things in my head, you know. To me, one of the worst things that happens is people who sell drugs, you know, people who take drugs and are addicted, I pray for God to help them. The people who sell drugs and addict people to them, man, I just want God to punish them. I confess that to you. I just want them to somehow be stopped because I think how horrible it is that they live that way, that they addict kids and stuff to drugs. I just want them to be punished somehow for how terrible they are. For people who commit violence against other people unnecessarily, boy, I just want them to be stopped, you know, because they live their lives hurting people like that. I just want them to be stopped. And I pray for their victims to be helped. You see, Matt says, Matt says, that all those people, they need to stop. They're sinners. The way they're living their lives is wrong. And that's what Matt says, and Matt wants somehow God to stop them, change them, get a hold of their lives, turn them around, God's spirit to fill them and change them and make them a different person than they are right now where they're helping people instead of hurting people. But you see, it's easy for myself to think, I'm not like that. I don't hurt people. I help people. It's hard for me to think sometimes. My debt also cannot be repaid. I'm a sinner also. God loves everyone the same. God loves everyone the same. And God wants to still get a hold of my life and come into my heart and turn me around and make me the person that God wants me to be just as much as God wants to get a hold of anyone else and fill their hearts and lives and turn them around. And if everyone in the world would believe that God wants to get a hold of them and get into their hearts and fill their lives with God's spirit, and help them change and grow to be more like Jesus, if we were all desperate for that, then each of us would change and the world would change. But the problem is we are see ourselves like Simon and think, well, you know, we're pretty good people. Yeah, I have a debt, but it isn't that much. 
In one of the verses at the end, Jesus says, people who think they've been forgiven little tend to love little. People who think they've been forgiven little tend to love little. People who think they've been forgiven much are filled with gratitude and tend to love much. Well, I have been forgiven much. Each of us has. We don't compare ourselves to people, other people in this world. We think about ourselves and what God needs to do in us. Now, I don't want you to leave this place this morning thinking you are a terrible person, thinking you are a terrible sinner, that I'm trying to put us all down. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. We're pretty good people, but we are sinners. I'd like to think I'm a good person, but I'm a sinner. And I have a debt I cannot repay. It is only through God's grace that I am saved. God is mighty to save. And when I think of my life, I need to think about how I should be so grateful that my debt of sin has been canceled, that eternal life is waiting for me, for those I love, that their debt has been canceled, that I should be just ready to serve God ready for God to take me and use me. Like I should be like the woman in the story who was ready to be at Jesus' feet and say, you've forgiven me, I am ready to show you my love. And I will desperately show you, Jesus, my love for how you love me. We're gonna close by singing a song together this morning that is a contemporary song, but it's actually an older one now. But it talks about this idea this idea that we should be desperate for God, that God should be the very air that we breathe or the bread that we eat, that God should be every day what fills us and our desire every day should be to be desperate for God. We shouldn't be confident in our own goodness, but know that God repays, God takes away all of our sin, all of our debt, that we're all equal in the eyes of God, that God loves us all. We all are saved by God's mercy. And so we should all be desperate to thank God and be in God's presence and grateful enough to serve God. The song is called Breathe. I invite you to please stand if you're able as we join together in singing this song.
I try to make that or something like that a prayer in my life, that God would be my daily bread, that God would be the air I breathe, that I would be in God's presence each day and be desperate for God and desperate for God to get a hold of me and make me the person God wants me to be because I confess to you that I sometimes play Matt says and Matt says, God, get a hold of those other people and take them and change them because they make this world such a terrible place and hurt people. And I want to be quicker to say, God, get a hold of me. That's what Simon needed to say. That's the point of the story that I'm too much sometimes like Simon. God, get a hold of me. Be the bread that I eat. Be the air that I breathe. Let me be desperate for you. Be in my life and take me and use me to make myself and this world what you want it to be. And if all God's people everywhere would take up that prayer, imagine the people we would be and the world we would build as you leave this place and do so with your lives. May the blessings of God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, and the peace and unity of the Holy Spirit be with you now. Remain with you forevermore. Amen.